Welcome in to Press Box Live. I'm Stan the Fan Charles of both Press Box and PressBoxOnline.com. With me is my usual co-host on Monday nights, Ross Grimsley. Ross, how are you? Everything good, Stan. How are you guys doing? Doing great. Doing great. great. Hey, uh, I wanted to introduce Luke Jackson. People know who he is. They're starting to know who he is. He's the managing editor of Press Box. And boy, I'm, I mean, I've been around baseball a long time. Luke knows his stuff. And I wanted to start figuring a way to get him in the mix. So I thought at least right now, we'll start once a month. We'll, we'll defer from getting a guest and Luke will join us. And we'll have kind of a round table of some topics that we want to kick around. All right. So without further ado, I'll remind everybody that these Zooms on Monday and Thursdays, sometimes Monday and Wednesday, are brought to you by the Costas Inn. The Costas Inn, located 4100 North Point Boulevard in the heart of Dundalk. Uh, the phone number is 410-477-1975. The website, and I'm going to give it to you, is costasin.com. And the reason I'm giving it to you is during the pandemic, the Costas Inn guys stepped up their game quite a bit in the curbside carryout business. They're now one of the preeminent places around Baltimore to uh, call in, pay for your food, pick it up. It's packaged nicely, whether it's steamed crabs, crab cakes, steak, chicken, salads, you name it. Uh, they've got it there at the Costas Inn. So uh, we thank the boys, Nick and Pete, for sponsoring this. And uh, please, again, check out the menu, costasin.com. All right, guys, I thought I'd start it out. Uh, I noticed the New York Yankees, they're, they're, they lost yesterday for a uh, rarity. They'd rarity. gone 16 and two. They'd gone 16 and one until yesterday when they lost after lead, leading eight to three in the middle innings. Um, they've gone 16 and two in their last 18 games. And it hit me at the 1984 Tigers. Remember, Ross, you remember that team. They were, 19, <laughs> they were 19 and two under Sparky Anderson. They were 26 and four and they were 35 and five. So from 26 and four, they slowed down a little there. The next they only won <laughs> one of their next eight or nine games, but it struck me. I wonder, I said, I wonder what kind of pace the Yankees are on with that team. Now I do remember that the Tigers of 60 of 84 didn't end up with the most wins all time, they slowed down. I think the second half of the year, they were something like 68 and 53. But right now at the 66 game mark, the New York Yankees are dead even with that 1984 Tigers club. Thoughts, anybody? Yeah, that, you know what, Stan? They, uh, I mean, they got off to a little bit of a slow start. They did last year too, uh, but they've kicked things into gear. They're pitching, I mean, uh, ever since, uh, Judge uh, didn't take what they offered him. He's went yeah. off on a, on a tangent, yeah. you know. Yeah. And Stanton, for that matter, and uh, Rizzo gets the big hits when he's when he's needed. But the Yankees, got, what's he got? Eighteen home runs, Luke. Something like that, yeah. But they, he he's been they've been playing, you know, outstanding. The pitching has been uh, uh, very good for them, and they have a what? A, they got a 10, 12 lead on the eleven the rest game of the lead over Toronto. Yeah. eleven game lead over Toronto, even after right. losing yesterday, and knock on wood for them. This year, Luke, they haven't had the injuries that they've had over the last three or four years. Right. You're absolutely right. And for me, the biggest thing that separates the Yankees from the rest of the competition in the American League right now is that starting rotation, as Ross pointed out. Even the, the other you know, really good teams in the American League, you think about Toronto, you think about Tampa, uh, you think about some other teams like Houston. They've got you know one or two spots in their rotation that they could stand to upgrade at the deadline. A couple of places in their rotation where you know, they're not totally satisfied with what they've gotten. You know, for, with the Yankees, rotation spots one through five, it, it they've been dynamite. Uh, yeah. And you look at what Jamison Tyon has done, who came into the season almost expected to be like their number four or five starter. And he has been the Jamison Tyon that the Pittsburgh Pirates thought that they were getting when they drafted him ahead of Manny Machado in 2010. He's been terrific. And then, of course, the, the big uh, revelation for them has been Nestor Cortez, who was a one-time Oriole. who when he Five was, picks was, by Dan Duquette. Yep. <laughs> who, when he was with the Orioles, was not ready. 
uh, for the bright lights. Uh, and I think he only lasted about four or five innings with the, uh, with the Orioles before he got sent back to the Yankees. Uh, but since, uh, since then, he's sort of proven why Dan Duquette took a chance on him. That, and he's developed a high cutter that's almost Andy Pettit-like in the way that he's able to get right-handed hitters out with it, where it starts on the outside corner to right-handed hitters and it darts in on them and it really saws them off and it really gives them pro- they just, hitters just don't pick them up. They've got he's got a 91 mile an hour fastball that plays more like 96 or 97. It's and pretty sneaky is what it comes and to I, and yeah. Ross, you're a perfect person to ask about this. Yeah. As as a former left hander, when you watch Cortez, what does he do that's so effective that the radar gun suggests that he should not be nearly as effective as he is, but yet he's able, if the all-star game were to happen next week, he'd probably start for the American league. Right. Oh, you know, he, he changes speeds. And like you said, he's, he's picked up that, uh, that uh, harder breaking ball, but he's a guy that the hitters don't pick, uh, pick the ball up much like Zimmerman did last year when he came up and earlier uh, in, in this season, but for some reason, uh, they're picking the ball up better, but that's he he hides it pretty well. The ball jumps out of his hand, jumps on the hitters, and he can elevate it and get get by with that 91, 92 heater that they're looking uh, that they're not looking for. But like I said, they don't pick him up real well, and he's got really good off speed. But and he throws strikes. That's one of the big mm-hmm. things. He throws quality pitches. Uh, he locates when he gets ahead, and that's that's pitching. He changes speed, so he has been a a big uh, a difference maker for that rotation. I want to talk about one other under the radar move for the Yankees is the last two or three years, Araldis Chapman has been nothing but high drama. You know, even when he's been effective, he'll walk a couple guys, they'll the runners will be in scoring position. He's just gotten by. I think this year, the injury to him, whether it's legit or not, and I'm sure it is, but I, I don't think he has the job anymore. I think uh, Clay Holmes, who they mm-hmm. picked up last August from Pittsburgh or late July, has come in and quietly, he's just professional. He comes in and it's like one, two, three, ball game's over. Uh, I'm sure Chapman will come back and play a part late in games, uh, but I think he might end up being more like for just left-handed hitters. I think Clay Holmes has really developed nicely, Luke. Yeah, I mean, he's been one of the best. He and Jorge Lopez have been maybe the two best relievers in the American League uh, this year, and they sort of do it in similar ways. They both have a high 90s power sinker that hitters just can't do anything with. Uh, Almost a little like Zach Britton from the left side when he was going really good with the Orioles and the Yankees uh, a a few years ago at this point. But but he and Lopez have pretty similar arsenal. Uh, And honestly, like Holmes, his fastball, you know, plays even a little bit heavier than Lopez's, believe it or not. Uh, It's for with those two guys, that sinking fastball is just hitters just they can't do anything with it because it moves so much. It's so firm. Uh, and even when they do make contact, it's not very good contact. So uh, both of those guys have been just terrific this year. And you know, again, if the All-Star game were held next week, both of those guys would be in the American League bullpen. Yep. You know, Ch- Chapman's a guy that I think when he comes back, he'll be, they'll have to put him in the middle or a setup role or something. He just doesn't throw enough strikes. I mean, he can throw a couple strikes and he might throw five or six balls in a row that completely out of the zone. So yep. he's a guy that, you know, great arm, but his command at the end of the end of the uh, bullpen is just not where you want it to be. Ross, what's on your docket? You know, one of the things, you know, Manny got hurt yesterday. Manny yep. Machado got hurt. And uh, the big talk, uh, you know, I've heard this before. They only want to make the bases uh, 18 inches and uh, make it bigger and whatever. But uh and with all the geniuses you have at the front office of all these uh, these clubs and in uh, Major League Baseball, you think that they could come up with a base. Now, I, 47, 48 years in professional baseball, I only saw a guy, uh, I think four or five at the most guys, get hurt slipping on a bag. Yep. Oh, four or five in 47, 48 years. Now they want to completely revamp the bases and do stuff. You would think with, like I said, all the geniuses that you'd have, you could come up with a way to make the bases uh, where you wouldn't slip on it. The well, other I, thing, the, I, the I, other thing with Manny and, and some of the other players that I've seen get hurt 
if they are wearing spikes instead of turf, they're not going to slip on the bases. I saw most of the people get hurt on home plate when that gets damp later mm -hmm. in the evening of games. And it's very easy to slide on it if you have the turf shoes on and not the spikes. You have the spikes, it's completely different. And I think that's what happened last night. Uh, he slipped on a bag, lunging for the uh, for the base and slipped on it. And I either his knee or his ankle, I forget which one it was. His ankle, left ankle. Yeah. I think. But yeah. I, I really it's think like with he, all, of, all, he, the, all the geniuses, they could come up with some type of base where yeah. you wouldn't wouldn't slip on it when it gets yeah. wet. Yeah. And that's yeah, and this, all this the was a, they don't do nothing. This was a little pet project of uh, Buck Showalter. That Buck he Showalter always used to talk about. He, he, Buck would always say, and I'm sure he says the same thing now. I'm sure he's telling yep. the media the same thing, that the bases are too hard and that when it rains, they've become too slick. And the reason that Buck said that they are hard uh, and that is that <laughs> MLB likes to auction off the bases. And and that was, there you go. Oh, there you go. And I and what was yesterday? It was Father's Day. And guess what? They probably had a little Father's Day emblem on sure. the bases, and they could probably auction off the bases. Uh, so that was the reason that Buck had. Uh, now, to your point, you know about the bigger bases and having softer bases, they could absolutely do that. I now I don't know what the reason is why these bases are the way they are. Uh, the other incident that. Uh, comes to mind is the Bryce Harper one, which was at this point several years ago, but it was a rainy day and he was busting it down the first base line. Uh, and it's same thing. He was trying to beat out an infield hit. Uh, he's, he's tried to stretch one into an infield single and his leg just kind of landed awkwardly on the wet, wet base and he hyperextended his ankle, his uh, knee, excuse me. Uh, and he was out for uh, a few weeks uh, and it was an ugly looking injury. Uh, but to your point, I, I don't know what the what the answer. I, I assume that maybe it's something to do with the competition committee. Uh, I know with the collective bargaining agreement, the owners thought to have uh, more of a right to um, unilaterally implement some ideas that they had. Uh, so I don't know if softer bases would be one of them. I, I don't I, I don't know the answer to that. But yes, to your point, uh, so softer bases ah. for me makes ah. sense. I'll bet that the bases have been as hard as they have been. They want to they want to differentiate themselves from situations that we see in softball all the time, where a guy can't quite, you know, touch the bag because it's out of place. You know, these bases stay exactly right. where they are, and there's a reason for that. But after the Bryce Harper thing, I remember Buck talking about it quite a bit, and it is a pet peeve, a pet peeve of his. And I think with the new bases where they are going to expand the size of them a little bit, they're going to have to come up with some other way to, to that they've got a Just little Just give them a little more, more give. That's all. Yeah, a little yeah. bit more give. Well, either that but, or, but or Ross do something talking, to make them where you won't slide on it. That, right. That's the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, but they're, Ross, they're, is, they're, but Ross, you hit the nail on the head, too. If the, if the base runner is wearing cleats, he's not going to slide on it. No. Right. It's those, ru it's yeah. those hard rubber... Fights right, and they're more the, comfortable yeah. aware on yep. the on the on the surface, and, on the but surface. it's it leads to that problem. But I would think that you could make a base with a material there you wouldn't slide. Yeah, I mean right. it, it can't be that tough, you know. Yeah. But look, the look, the other thing I want to talk about too is the baseballs. Now there's a lot of you know a lot of ever since Major League Baseball took over uh, the manufacture of the balls. Now people are getting, uh, obviously everybody's complaining about their slick. You can't hold them. They can't throw them. You can't do this and that. Now there's talk about there's a different ball in different parks. Now, there's a lot of heard, talk I haven't about heard that. that one yet. I haven't heard that oh, one. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, they, they talk about uh, one, uh, one, uh, one night, a lot of low scores, and the balls aren't traveling. And uh, the next uh, maybe a couple of nights, there's a team score <laughs> You know, hey, now, now that baseball, now that baseball's affiliated with the gambling, maybe exactly. they, they and that was betting, and that's my that maybe was they're my betting next, on the over unders. On that's the my next story. You know that my next uh, comment was with the gambling and now messing with the balls. And now I mean, a lot of people go, you know, we're hitting balls that are not going out, and then we hit them off the end of the bat and they go out. And that, that you start scratching your head a little bit when when all a lot of players are talking about that. And then you get the gambling involved. Now you go, wait a minute. 
you know, so that, that's something that, Interesting. Uh, yeah, oh yeah. And since major league baseball took over, uh, you know, like I said, the manufacture of the balls. And that's why I told you, we have this, uh, Dr. Meredith Mills, uh, uh, Wills. we're having her on in July. We're going to have her on and she does, uh, a, a, a big in-depth, uh, uh, writings about this. And, uh, it, it's really interesting, but yeah, just kind of scratch your head. And, uh, what are your thoughts on that guys? Well, that was another uh, Buck Showalter pet peeve that I'm sure, again, that he's talking with uh, <laughs> the Pets media about, right, was the baseball and how he said that the Japanese ball, that the, the ball they use uh, in the uh, in Japan, they he said that when you take it out of the packaging, when you take it out of the box, it's ready to go. And it doesn't need to be rubbed up with mud. Rubbed up, yeah. It doesn't need rods, and it doesn't need any of that. It's just it's because it's, it's made of, like, with a tacky surface, um, on the outside now in terms of the ball being deader this year or more dead i should say than it has been in years past you know, I, I was actually talking to my dad about this yesterday you know he said why can't mlb just create a ball and just stick with it and like why can't they just create a neutral ball uh what you know and i said well uh, you know there are some ways you can toy with the baseball to uh make offense more explosive so to speak and there are some ways you can deaden the ball uh, so that there aren't as many home runs. And I, to, to your point, you, you can monkey with the baseball. And when you look at the big offensive spikes throughout the years, it almost always comes with a livelier baseball as a, as I'm sure everyone knows at this point. Uh, and then if you look at, you know, the, the stretches throughout history where there hasn't been a lot of offense, it's almost always come with a deader baseball. Right. So I don't know what that neutral baseball looks like. I don't know what year you could go back to and say that was a perfect baseball. Just use the 2015. Base. I don't know. I don't. I, well, you know, if, they, if they would come out that there were a couple different baseballs used throughout Major League Baseball, you know, depending upon what park that would blow the roof off us. Some of this big stuff. Time. I mean, it really big time. You know, Ross, I wanted to just a quick, quickly zap around. You know, about the gambling, you know, about five or eight years ago, they stopped announcing who the home plate umpire was going to be yeah. until the game started. Right. Did you actually, and, and there were in, in baseball reference, they used to have records of pitchers with a certain umpire behind yeah. uh, with all the umpires. Behind it's in baseball plate. reference. It used Did to you, be in baseball, baseball yeah, reference. It probably I don't not, know if it's. I don't right. know if it's there anymore, but you could you could see what your record was with this right. particular. Right, you could see like Mike Messina with uh, sure. Merrill, you know, or uh, Country Joe, uh, what's right. his name? Yeah. So I wanted to ask you: Did you ever have a couple umpires that you knew? Hey, I got uh, you know I got this guy Jerry Crawford tonight. Uh, I'm going to do better. Well, I mean, you you knew you knew what they did. You knew what they called. What they, if a guy was a he calls strikes. And, and a lot of times, you know, as a Kenny Singleton, a, as a hitter, I mean, you had to, you had to be, he had a good eye. He had so a great eye. he wasn't going to, you know, they were going to, he was going to get the benefit of the doubt. We all knew that. Everybody knew that. Everybody knew the umpires. We, we knew who the umpires were and what they and called. And back in those days, by the way, there were American league umpires and national league umpires. Yes. And there were, there's a difference in the two leagues. I know when yep. I was in, when I was in a national league, if you threw the ball above the knees, it was a ball, right? If the you lows. threw the ball, I mean, you got the higher strike in the American league. I, when I got to the American league from Cincinnati, I, I throw pitches that I would go, Oh, darn, it got strike. I'm going, you gotta be kidding me. You know, now we didn't get <laughs> as many low pitches, but we got the higher pitches, you know, now remember we, the big difference back then was the, the national league umpires had the vest inside the, their sport coat yeah they could get right up over right. the catcher whereas the american league had the balloon protector the balloon, yeah, yeah and exactly. they, couldn't, they couldn't get up as close right and and you knew you knew the umpires that that were the uh that were going to call strikes you knew the umpires that if you hit certain if you hit a spot consistently that spot would get bigger if it moved uh, an inch or so outside you'd get that you know, you earned your way and the hitters earned their way, but we knew the umpires. We knew what they, you know, that 
he was a high ball umpire. He's a low ball umpire. He'd give the ball outside, wouldn't give the ball inside. So we knew that these guys have no, they don't even know who the umpires are now. Right. I right. mean, because first of all, they're too busy looking at their iPads and phones during the games. <laughs> they don't even watch what's going on during the game. And their cars. How, how would you know? And now I mean, they're, it, now they're full in with the headgear too. Well, they're, yeah, really? So, I mean, it, it's a, it's a different animal out there now, but I mean, it's God, they're missing so much of the game. You know, what's, what's going on? Luke, what do you got? Well, I wanted to talk about uh, the Nationals with them coming into town. I guess they're not too far away anyway. Yeah, uh, Battle of the Beltway. Yeah, so they're going into town uh, for a game on Tuesday and Wednesday, games on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, and Stan and I, over the weekend, were talking about what could be next for the Nationals because apparently the learners uh, might want to sell within the next year or so. Uh, I hear there are like 10 or 12 people, uh, different groups lining up to buy that team. Right. Uh, they have a lot of bad money on the books. Uh, Patrick Corbin is on the books for a long time. Steven Strasburg is on the books for a long time. Uh, they don't have much of a farm system at this point. Uh, and really, they haven't developed a ton of talent over the last several years. Uh, they, expend, they used a lot of resources uh, in trades in order to win the World Series in 2019. They're not exactly where the Orioles were in 2018 because they have Juan Soto. And if they play that right, they could get a franchise altering package in return. And what I told Stan, what I concluded to Stan was that I thought that Soto, who I believe is rep by Scott Boris uh, and turned down $350 million offer from the nationals this past off season before the lockout. What I said to Stan was that I thought that Soto would get dealt within the next 13 to 14 months. He's got net. He's got. He's under contract with the Nationals. I mean, they have to pay him arbitration right. for next year and twenty four. Right. right. So I think he's under contract for next year. He has a number for next year, and then I think uh, he's under club control for a final year in twenty twenty four. So my question to you guys is: You're Mike Rizzo. You've got ownership instability right now. You'll probably have a new owner. I would say within the next twelve months. Right. That seems to be. Yeah. What the reporting is you have this huge player who's still under club control, but you need to also rebuild your organization uh, in terms of the talent level from top to bottom. What do you do? <laughs> yeah, you're really. Well, Ross, you, go ahead. I mean, you, you said it. They're not in the position that the Orioles or the Astros were in totally revamped. I don't think, I don't think, I, I don't know. I think in of, some ways, I'll tell you what, I think in some ways they're worse than the Astros or the Orioles were. I see nothing coming up yeah, in well, that organization right now. Yeah, I, I, they I, don't, did, yeah. I, I don't think they'll do uh, what they, those clubs did. I think they have a they have enough people down there, and they can go out and get some. Uh, it all depends. You you get a you get a big uh, a big package for Soto. That will be a start right there. But again, you've got to, you're going to have to. Uh, you know, you're going to have to be smart with your trades. You're going to have to be smart with your drafting. You're going to have to be smart with waivers, uh, picking up players. And I think, I don't know if teams want to go through five, six years of losing. I don't think, uh, and people especially, are saying, especially, the, the, the especially, especially now where you're not automatically going to get the number one pick. Exactly. Right. You're going to a no, lot. Right. Of so I, I, I think they, uh, they have to do, uh, they have to be smart with their, uh, uh, their picks and their acquisitions and, and what have you. It, it's uh, I don't know if the, they want the fan base to go through five or six years of losing. I mean, that, we see what happens in Baltimore. They don't like this. They, they don't like it, you know, and, and, and I don't think a lot of people like it. Now, what's the outcome? Hopefully it's, uh, you know, it's something good here the next few years, which the, the, the team and the city and the organization really needs, but uh, you know, that, well, the Nats, they, have to, they have to be smart. They have to be smart in what, what they're doing. They've been in, in between a rock and a hard place with, with some real big time talent. And for the life of me, I'm kind of confused how you let a Bryce Harper talent just leave for a draft pick. I mean, I just can't imagine uh, an organization doing that. And then they doubled down. They did the same thing with Rendon. And right. then they waited too long with Scherzer and they had to throw Trey Turner into the deal to get back a couple, you know, this Josiah Gray is going to be a nice pitcher. 
he's going to be a nice pitcher. And Ruiz he's, has a chance to be a nice catcher. And a, a nice catcher, but he's not going to be a star. Right. Uh, right. And that's all basically all they got for Harper, Turner. I mean, Harper, Turner, uh, Rendon. I, I just I couldn't imagine how in the world they threw Turner into that deal. Right. That just was staggering to me. Yeah, in terms of in terms of Soto, and now we've seen in Baltimore what happens, what can happen if you have a superstar and you wait until to trade him until he has two years before free agency. And that's not to say that you can't get a stud in return. You know, we've seen it happen like a role as Chapman when he was dealt uh, from the Cubs to the Yankees, or excuse me, from the Yankees to the Cubs, excuse me. Uh, and he he got a stud. We saw Andrew Miller uh, got a really good pitcher in Eduardo Rodriguez. But I think those kind of returns for players who only have two months of control, I think those are few and far between. Usually, chances are you're not going to get a ton for a player with uh, two, only two months of control. Really, the time to make a decision on a player like Soto will be at some point next year before the trade deadline. Or even this offseason. Or no. this offseason. So off that you can where sell a team has both. two has two yes. years of control. Of yes. It. And that that's how you can really leverage that kind of player into a franchise altering uh, package. Because if the Orioles had uh, managed the uh, Machado situation a little differently, they certainly would have gotten more uh, out of uh, him than they ended but they up. had they had that contract the, the the Machado deal and the Britain deal they were right. both ended up being there we, we had very little leverage and well I thought, and, and I thought overall Duquette did very well for what, what at the time did. sure and and you know as well as anybody Stan that Dan wanted to trade Britain the year prior yeah. but he wasn't allowed to yeah and I'm sure that Dan would have liked to have moved on from Machado at that point too but the, the Orioles weren't even yeah. willing to uh, consider that at that point. And uh, we, we eventually got to that finish line anyway, but it is what it is. Yeah. You think they deal Soto uh, before the trade deadline this year? No, I, I, Mike Rizzo has unequivocally stated on the record that he's not going to do that. Uh, and when Mike does that, usually he's a man of his word. So I'm going to take him at his word. Yeah. I, I He's the been pressed pretty strong up. about that on the record. The pressure may come there on Soto with with if there's a new owner that's really a leader, like right. that they say, hey, it looks like they're going to sell it to this guy. And they've kind of dictated the terms that we want him off the books. You know, that that's possible that that could happen. Hey, I wanted to talk about uh, one one last thing. And then I think Luke's got you got one more, Luke. One more. And then, OK, and I'll I'll be quick about it. Uh, you know, Mike Elias came in between the 18 and 19 season. I think it was November of 18. He came 19 was his first year and he brought in, it took him a little while to hire his manager, but he brought in Brandon Hyde. And I got to say, you know, all the people, the media, they love Buck Showalter. So they were all suspect about Brandon Hyde and Hyde's had, frankly, up until this year, he has had one almost horseshit team, uh, really. I mean, you know, when yeah. you go out and the, acqu the acquisition is Rio Ruiz, you know, um, they take your, your potentially decent starter and Andrew Kashner and trade them for two 16-year-old Dominican kids. You know, I mean, and then Julio Iglesias, Jose Iglesias is playing solid shortstop and hitting for you. And they deal him for, you know, a, pro a prospect. And you take Bundy and turn him into four. Every time they're cutting Brandon's legs off, you know, Richard Blyer goes, Tanner Scott, Cole Solcer goes. It was always two steps forward, three backwards. Um, so now here we are. We're nearing the fourth year of Brandon Hyde being manager of the Baltimore Orioles. I think it's high time. I think the club, he's never lost a club. He's never lost a clubhouse. Players have always respected him. They play hard for him, not just in a cliched way. They play pretty hard for him. And I think he commands a lot of respect. I think it's one of the reasons the Orioles had so few COVID uh, problems back in 2020, uh, because they adhered to the protocols, because they were demanded from them by Brandon Hyde. I think it's high time we find out what Brandon Hyde's future is with the Baltimore Orioles. I know Mike is Mike Elias keeps a lot of stuff 
close to the vest. He may have already extended them next year, and they won't tell us that until this year. But I'd like to see Brandon get like a two-year extension and show that the club is all in on him as much as he's been all in on the managing the club. Thoughts? Yeah. yeah. And so if, as best we can tell, Stan, he's under contract in some way next year, right? Whether okay. that's option year, whether that's a guarantee, it's not really clear, but it appears that he's under contract. But what's the necessity for all the secrets? Secret. Right, right. And I, and I do agree with you that, you know, whether it comes from the top and John or whether it comes from Mike direct, I, I don't know how that would happen, but I think that a public show of support for Brandon in the job that he's done. It would uh, be a feel good story. It would be feel good. You know, Hey, we got our guy, you know. Uh, and, and Ross, what, what do you think? Yeah, I just, you know, what they what people have done in the past in these situations they they get the guy they get him for uh you know the lowest salary you can give a guy and uh and, and then when they when they start turning the corner they get rid of them and you just I, you hate to see that and, and I, I hope that doesn't happen uh but then but then again you know i basically you know what kind of manager is is Hyde? What what kind of manager do, do do we know? What kind of manager? I mean, most of these games are choreographed by the front office. They're predetermined who's pitching, who's playing, and, and they do that. Now, not all the managers, but I bet you seventy five percent of them in the major leagues, uh, minus Buck Showalter and maybe a few other guys, run their own show. But uh, I I think it would be fair to give him, you know, like you said, hey, give him a two-year contract, yeah. but don't, uh, I mean, you're I not just talking don't... about money that's going to break the bank. I mean, no, gonna heavens, no you're, like... you're going to get him for, you know, you're going to get him 1. for 1.5, 1.7. Well, I mean, it it like... might, might not even be that, but, yeah. uh, I mean, pay him, you know, get, give him something fair. You're going to get him for a little of nothing anyway. And, uh, I mean, he's done, a, you know, he's done what, what they wanted him to do. You know, I, I just don't know what kind of manager he is because you, you how, how do you grade managers now? Right. They're not right. in control of nothing. I, I grade know, them. Very, I, grade very them I grade them by how hard his team plays. Sure. And I think but I mean, I, I, I mean, I think that, that's this team playing. They respect him. I can tell they respect Buck, uh, uh, Brandon Hyde. Yeah. I, I oh, really it, think they do. They're, they're a bunch of, they should be getting better because they've got picks over the last, the top picks. Over the last several years, you you better be getting better. But as as far as he's done what they wanted him to do, uh, reward him. Yep. You know now when it comes time to, but I, again, I, I, who knows what kind of manager he is? I, I don't maybe, know. Maybe you know? they can bring Tony Larusa in. Well, that's a that's a whole. <laughs> I think though, I think he's uh, hey, he's Luke, gone. I think. Luke, Luke, why don't you wrap it up? <laughs> so I wanted to follow up on this discussion that we had about five or six weeks ago, particularly me and Ross were talking about Adley Rutschman, right? Yeah. Uh, and we were talking about the cover story I did for the April press box and what kind of impact. And the story was really about what kind of impact he could have on the pitching staff and on the team in general as a catcher uh, and not necessarily uh, as an offensive player early on in his career. Uh, and we talked to, and the title of the story was it takes a leader. And I, I was caught by what the praise that Jim Palmer on the uh, massive broadcast this uh, weekend was giving uh, Adley in terms of his game calling uh, mm -hmm. a uh, shutout on uh, Friday uh, and he caught a one run game uh, yes, on true. Sunday. And actually on Friday, he drove in the lone run as well. Uh, and, and Palmer every once in a while will make little snide comments, right? Like, Oh, Severino doesn't get that last year or something like that. <laughs> he's always got a little, he's got a little oh, snide he comment here and there uh, that he'll throw in there. And I, so I just wanted to follow up on the discussion that we had five or six weeks ago, Ross, and, and ask, what have you seen out of Rutschman as a catcher? Because for me, he, he's, and the one thing, and, and Stan and I were also talking about this. He's super energetic. You know, after after really good inning, he's super energetic. He seems like he's a really, really – he and Chirinos seem like they're really, really uh, fun guys to work with as pitchers. And I and I do believe that part of the uh, improvement that they've had out on the mound this year, particularly in the bullpen, has to come from the improvement uh, in the catching. Uh, it has to. 
uh, you know, based on where they were at this point last year with that position. So, Ross, I, I just want to ask, what did you, have you seen out of Rutschman defensively as a catcher in the first month or so of his career? Yeah, no, he he's everything is advertised, you know. And one of the things you don't you notice him, but you don't notice him back there. You don't you don't see a lot of he makes the plays that we normally didn't see last year. You know, balls that were just flying by a guy, but he he sets up like a like a catcher. He's not catching on one knee. He does occasionally when no one's on. You you may see it, but he is. Uh, he gives a, you love a catcher that uh, the target looks big, you know, bench behind the, behind the plate, the target looked big. So you had a big spot to throw to, you know, and, uh, but he's a guy that he, he threw a guy out the other day, got rid of the ball in a hurry. Uh, he just does so many things uh, that you, that you don't, you don't, you, you know, he's there, but you don't notice him. And he just, now you expect the, you know, the plays to be made. What you notice is when there's somebody else back there, you notice that. Uh, that well, it, not it, as it, not as much right now because well, Torino's no. is a darn, darn yeah, good. Yeah, but but you, but you notice the negative more than more of the negative things oh, and yeah. remember more of the negative things. But but he he's done everything uh, defensively, uh, game calling, uh, uh, everything is that what you expected it to be. He's well, really. Seven, well, Seve's really helped out that Milwaukee club this year, you know, with that, <laughs> that one-year deal. <laughs> hey, guys. As far as, as far as the pitching, you know, yeah. the, the, the bullpen has been fantastic. They are so, they are effectively wild. You know, you can't, you can't sit. I know Batista with the split, all of them have improved. The big thing they've done, they're throwing the ball over the plate more or yeah. around the plate, whereas uh, – you know, Tate occasionally will get uh, erratic. Uh, and, and Perez will ball. occasionally get erratic. Yeah, it really. But the thing is, is you got to find where to use those guys because they got, you know, they, they have uh, pretty, they're usable arms, but you got to find this, the place to use them uh, in the game, you know. But uh, they have been, like I said, the bullpen has been really, you know, dynamite, have made big improvements. And with the, uh, with the the kid behind the plate, that that's only going to help him, you know. But it, the way he, he catches, receives, throws, and calls, so that, that that's a big big help. I don't have much to add to what Ross is saying. To me, the biggest thing is they're thirteen and fourteen since he's been brought up. Some of that obviously goes to Torino's too, because he's probably caught five games since uh, the kid's been up. I think Brandon Hyde has used him perfectly. I given him a day off here and there, a day off, DHing him a couple of times, take some pressure off of the kid, because uh, that is a pressurized job, day in and day out. I want to thank my co-hosts tonight, Ross Grimsley and Luke Jackson. We're going to do this once a month. We'll have the three of us in and kick around some baseball topics, guys. I appreciate your being with me. Ross and I will be back next Monday night. Uh, and we'll work on uh, who that guest is going to be. Is it going to be this doctor? Is that next no, week or the weekend? No, that, that's, the, that's the 11th. The 11th, okay. The 11th of July. July. We okay. got the doctor then. <laughs> All right. Guys, thanks a lot. I got to say some words about the Costas Inn. Uh, Costas Inn, located at 4100 North Point Boulevard, is the place to go uh, for, of course, if you want to watch a ball game, sit there and eat your crabs, crack your crabs, eat a crab cake, a steak. They got specials every night. But don't forget that they are the place in and around Baltimore now for curbside takeout, whatever you want to call it, the Costas Inn. Their menu is on the website, costasin.com. Phone number, 410-477-1975. It's really seamless. You call up, you order off of the, off the menu that's on the website, and you pay for it with your credit card, you pick it up, it's packed nice and neat, still warm when you get it home, or you may have to heat it up a little bit, but the taste is still Costas in worthy. That's it for this week. Again, for Luke Jackson and my friend Ross Grimsley, I'm out of here, and I'll be back Wednesday night at 7 o'clock with Kyle Harrison of the PLL, the Premier Lacrosse League, and then Thursday night I'll be on with Terry Hazeltine, and we'll do the postmortems on 
Baltimore's failed bid to host games in the 2026 World Cup. Big disappointment. All right, that's it for now. Enjoy your night. Bye.